Lecture 10. Stewards of the Divine Mysteries. 1 Corinthians 4 verses 1 to 5. Let a man so account of us, as of the ministers of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover it is required in stewards, that a man be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment, yeah, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time, until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Verses 1 5. These words follow very naturally on what we have been looking at in the third chapter. The Apostle has been seeking to put the servants of Christ in their right place before the minds of the saints in Corinth. There had been a tendency to factionalism and sectionalism, they were exalting certain leaders and rallying round them, instead of recognizing that these leaders, evangelists, pastors, teachers, were simply God-given servants for the blessing of the whole church. These servants of Christ are God's gift to the church for the blessing of the whole, whether Paul, the teacher, or Apollos, the eloquent preacher, or Cephas, the stirring exhorter. God has given all to his people for their blessing. Now he turns to consider the responsibility of the servants of Christ and says, Let a man so account of us, as of the ministers of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. We are inclined to go to one extreme or the other, either to laud and praise and overestimate the ability and character of God's servants, or else on the other hand to set them at naught and disdain the instruction and help God intended them to give. He would have us take the middle course, not to foolishly flatter his servants, but to recognize that we have a great responsibility toward them as they seek to fulfill their responsibility toward us. They watch for our souls as those who must give account, and we are not to be angry or indignant if they have serious things to say to us at times concerning worldliness, carelessness, and carnality. We are rather to judge ourselves in the light of the word of God that they bring to us, for they are ministers of Christ. He does not use the ordinary word for servant which we find so frequently in his epistles, that is, bondservant, but here it is a word that has the thought of an official minister. They have been specially appointed to this particular service as ministers of Christ. Notice, Paul links up with himself not only Cephas who was an apostle, but Apollos who was not. Apollos, that eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures who first went forth preaching the baptism of John, who was not above being instructed by a godly woman and her husband, Priscilla and Aquila, and went forth to preach the gospel with greater liberty and power when he learned it more fully. He says, Do not put us on pedestals, do not form parties around us, but, let a man so account of us, as of the ministers of Christ. We are sent with a commission from the Most High, sent to sound forth his word, and we are responsible to do it faithfully. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. A steward is one to whom certain things are committed which he is to use for the benefit of others. God has committed his truth to us. Writing to Timothy, Paul says, That good, deposit, which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us, 2 Timothy 1 verse 14. And he was responsible to proclaim it faithfully. We then are stewards of the divine mysteries. We have seen that the New Testament mysteries are not abstruse truths difficult to apprehend, but sacred secrets that had not been known in previous ages. In Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 we hear Moses speaking to the people of Israel on the plains of Moab, just before they went over the Jordan to take possession of the promised land. He says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But when our Lord Jesus Christ came into the world, he uttered things that had been kept secret from the foundation of the world, and before he left his apostles he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come, John 16 verses 12 to 13. And so the present truth revealed by the Holy Spirit in our dispensation constitutes the mysteries, the sacred secrets, that the servants of God are now to make known. What are some of them? We have the mystery of the gospel. And what is that? It is that grand, wondrous truth that the mind of man would never have ferreted out if God had not revealed it, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19. It is that Christ upon the cross died to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, 
that having been delivered for our offenses, he has been raised again for our justification, and now in resurrection life he sends the message out into all the world that he that believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This is God's great secret. Man never would have thought of it. I know that the gospel is from God for I am somewhat familiar with almost all the different religious systems that are prevalent in the world, and apart from that which is revealed in this book not one of them ever intimates that God himself should provide a righteousness, righteousness for sinful man. They all demand a righteousness from man, but they simply point out different ways by which men are supposed to work out for themselves a righteousness that will make them fit for God. In the gospel alone we have the mystery explained how righteousness is provided for men who never could obtain it themselves. Our Lord Jesus Christ is made unto us wisdom, even righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, and we are stewards of this great mystery. Then we notice the mystery of godliness or piety, the great mystery of the incarnation of our Lord Jesus, God and man here on earth in one person. That is beyond human intelligence. We read, No man knoweth the Son but the Father. It is utterly impossible for men to understand the union of deity and humanity and yet this mystery is plain to him that believeth. We simply accept the revelation that God has given and all questioning is at an end. People talk about the problem of Christ. Christ is not a problem, he is the key to every problem. Everything else is made plain when we know Christ in whom dwelleth all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul opens up the great mystery of Christ and the church, set forth in two characters under the figure of a body and its head and that of a bride and a bridegroom. The Lord Jesus Christ glorified is the head of the body, and every believer indwelt by the Holy Spirit is a member of that body and becomes thus the fullness of him that fills all in all. In the other beautiful picture we are told that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female, and we read, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh, Genesis 2 verse 24. Paul says in speaking about the marriage relationship, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church, Ephesians 5 verse 32. Linked with this we have the mystery of the rapture, and that of the olive tree, Israel's present rejection and future regeneration. These various mysteries are the revelation to us of things kept secret from the foundation of the world. How few who take the place of being ministers of Christ ever unfold these mysteries, and yet this is the responsibility put upon Christ's servants. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. The business of a steward is not to electrify people by his eloquent sermons, not to dazzle them by his wonderful ability, not to please them by flowers of rhetoric, not to so speak that he will simply be to them as a lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, Ezekiel 33 verse 32 as was said of Ezekiel, but the business of a servant of Christ is to open up the truth of God, to unfold, to expound, to make known these mysteries in order that the people of God may appreciate the heritage that he has given them in the Word. In fulfilling this ministry, the servant of Christ may be open to criticism, but that is a small thing. The Apostle says, With me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment, yeah, I judge not mine own self. In other words, as long as I am faithful in opening up the Word of God, I am not concerned whether my sermons particularly appeal to you or not, as long as I know that I am pleasing Him that sent me I am not greatly concerned if I displease you. These Corinthians appreciated eloquence, oratory, and other special gifts, and they said of the Apostle Paul, why, his bodily presence is weak, and his speech contemptible. But he could say, well, that doesn't trouble me at all. Did I give you God's truth? that is what I am concerned about. Your appraisal, appraisal does not concern me in the least. It is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment, or, as the margin puts it, man's day. That is the entire period of time lasting from the rejection of Christ until he comes back again, while God is letting men try out one scheme after another to see what they can make of a world out of which they have cast the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, I judge not mine own self. I do not attempt to appraise my own service, I have no right to say, well, I think I did pretty well today, that was an excellent address. That may be simply the pride of the natural heart. On the other hand, I am not to go into a funk and throw myself down under a juniper tree, and say, it was all a failure, I certainly did make a mess of things. No servant of God is capable of appraising his own service. That which he might think to be excellent may be so much wasted time.
that which he thinks wasted time may have just the message for the moment. Then we read, I know nothing by myself. It is really, I know nothing. Against myself. I am not conscious of anything in my ministry of a harmful character. Yet am I not hereby justified, for I may be blundering even when I do not realize it. But he that, appraiseth, me is the Lord. He appraiseth everything rightly in accordance with his own holy word. He then warns the saints against attempting to get upon the judgment seat. It is not our place. Therefore judge nothing before the time. What time? The time when the Lord shall come. We have seen that, that when he returns he is going to carefully examine all the service of his people. He will separate the precious from the vile, he will distinguish between the gold, silver, and precious stones, and the wood, hay, and stubble. He will pronounce correct judgment upon the labors of his ministers. You and I cannot do that now, and it is better for us just to wait. Therefore judge nothing before the time, until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. You see, that is what you and I cannot do, we can hear what comes from the lips or note the actions, but we do not know the hidden springs behind all this. But when the Lord Jesus examines all our labor, he will bring everything to light, all the hidden things of darkness. Yes, if there was envy and jealousy and pride and carnality, he will drag it all out into the light, and many a sermon that sounded very beautiful, that was almost perfect as a piece of oratory, will be shown to be utterly spoiled in that day by the pride that was behind it. He will bring out all these hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. He will show where there was earnest preaching to glorify him, even though the speech was faltering and the expressions used were not all they should have been. He looks upon the heart, not merely the outward appearance. Then observe, he says, then shall every man, and he is speaking of believers, have praise of God. But some people say, oh, dear, I can do so little and do not seem to have any gifts. I am afraid there won't be anything the Lord can reward me for in that day. If you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God is dwelling in you, and in that coming day it will be made manifest that every Christian has accomplished something for God for which he can be rewarded. At the close of a meeting a brother said to me, didn't you go a little strong there? I said, no, I do not think I did. Well, he said, think of the dying thief, that man was saved just as he hung by the side of Christ, what opportunity did he have to do anything for which to get a reward? Why, my dear brother, I said, think of the dying thief again. There he hung nailed to a cross, he could not move a hand nor a foot, but he recognized in the man on the central cross the coming king of the ages and said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, and he turned to his fellow and rebuked him and bore witness to the perfection of Christ and said, We suffer justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. Luke 23 verse 41. At the judgment seat of Christ I think I see that redeemed man coming before his Lord, and he says to himself as he comes, I was saved only a few minutes before my Savior died, and I have had no opportunity to serve him, to witness for him, I cannot expect any reward. And then I think I hear my Lord say, everyone present who was converted through some sermon you heard about the dying thief, come here, and I imagine I see them coming until there are thousands and thousands of them, and I see my blessed Lord turn to that man and say, I want to give you this crown of rejoicing for all these souls that you have helped to win to a knowledge of my salvation. Do you not see it? Then shall every man have praise of God.